Hello, everybody, and welcome to Philosophy of Volunteerism podcast, episode five, How to Protest, with me, Danilo Cuellar, from PeaceFindingism.com, and Jim Limber Davis, from JimLimberDavis.com. So we're going to be talking about protesting and how we believe the best and most efficient way and means of protesting are in a time when, uh, you know, where people are out there, you know, talking about the, um, the no dapple, the, uh, Dakota pipeline protesting. And, you know, we had the Bundy ranch protesting. We had all these different people protesting. Is there a correct way to protest or an incorrect way? Uh, so we're going to delve as deeply as we can into that in this episode. So Jim, maybe, uh, you can start us off with, um, how you see protesting and what is the best way to achieve or let's say to voice your opinion and affect change well to uh do something like that voice an opinion about a change then it would be to our greatest benefit to actually understand what's going on in the case of protesting government that comprehension is going to be rooted in understanding what government actually is, what it's meant to be, what it actually is, and how it makes everything possible. So with government, everybody's protesting it. What is it that makes government such a problem? And it's always the underlying violence that is used to make government the, the issue here. So this is a subject that a lot of people beneath various liberty movements, or ideologies, and such will clash with us on. And just like the ideas we've previously discussed, uh, self-ownership, peace, and nonviolent communication, all the disagreements from their parts will stem from a lack of philosophical consistency and or clarity. I mean, this is – or that will be, I mean, an important part in understanding why we make certain choices in our positions. Uh, this is where all of the – times that I've discussed in this content and other times that I've created about the importance of having a transparent path of thought progression, uh, just like showing all of one's work on a math test. I mean, however, this kind of clarity requires building blocks starting from not, not understanding how to add and subtract or even count, but why we designate quantities in the first place. And that question is going to be akin to understanding why do we invoke morality. So – of course, this can be followed up immediately with, well, why do we want – what do we want freedom from, and why is peace not the goal but the means, and what are the goals we are – what we all strive for and and are – which are powered by being peaceful. But I think it's important to just understand the simple answer to the first question, why do we invoke morality? Now, we've touched on this in the past, and again, I've written about this in Morality Defined. It's free, so I'm not getting anything off of that, so for all the haters out there <laughs> – um, but uh, in short, filthy, you filthy capitalist making free content. <laughs> oh, don't flirt with me. <laughs> We're both involved with somebody else. Um, but in short, I mean, morality is it's invoked to create a set of communicable barriers uh, to designate where an individual's right to act or affect a change begins and ends. Essentially, self ownership and property ownership is what that means. And it's here that we begin to understand that such barriers allow us to focus. Less on the defense between those we can reason with each other and focus more on creating real wealth and making adjustments to one's own life to prevent or evade acts of destruction caused by things we cannot reason with, such as nature and the rest of the celestial bodies, which could end life on Earth in one fell swoop. So understanding why we invoke such a concept, morality, will change how we see voluntarism, protesting, government, religion, and so much more. Basically… This is about understanding how to serve ourselves and with greater returns on investment in the future by respecting the value others place upon their lives now and in the future. So I guess how does this translate to the topic of protesting? Well, demonstrations, picket signs, and marches only encourage participation in the government. We and many of our listeners already know that it should not have any legitimacy in the first place. 
if people understand consistently or understand and constantly apply and cherish the idea of consent. Uh, protesting in front of the White House or government buildings doesn't really do much since the entire legislative process is performed behind closed doors or in questionable voting events, uh, public and among elected officials alike. So, I mean, worse yet, these can also be organized by political donors to manipulate others already upset and into agreeing to something they do really agree with, but use sleight of hand tactics and mob mentality to get them to trick them into something else. So, using the rules of the system to fight the system, such as for specialty travelers' plates or tax exemptions and other common loopholes, will only bring attention for them to be closed. So, the state must be forced, I think, in its hand in a, such a way that a large majority, if not overwhelming majority of people, are suddenly put into a place of discomfort and forced to make a decision. I mean, without adequate philosophical study prior to any of this, such an outcome is almost guaranteed to be destructively violent, and that's what we want to avoid, which is, of course, why we do this program. So the idea of protesting is to stand up against acts of coercion and violations of consent, not negotiate how much less consent is going to be allowed by the violators or the state, and carrying picket signs and marching up and down the street is less efficient and effective when people doing the marching understand how to create clear or transparent paths of thought progression in order to answer the previously noted questions. So I think maybe the idea of protesting with signs and such is just a bread and circus act taught by government, kind of like voting is. All I know is that it's extremely inefficient today. Uh, Maybe, maybe it worked years ago, but the current state of affairs concerning the overreaching arm and eyeballs of at least the federal government are horrendous and scary. Uh, I think the real uh, protesting would be considered showing up to an event with equal force. It's kind of like, say, I don't want people to think I'm calling for outright violence. Absolutely not. That doesn't help anything at all whatsoever. Uh, the violence used to enforce laws without consent must be met with violence required in self-defense, but – and this is the important part – only to stop the violence used to enforce the laws. And this is something where – I actually wrote about this a couple of days ago, and I made a post on my Liberty Defined Facebook page where I said essentially, unfortunately, uh, without people willing to take up arms and instigate violence and self-defense in the moment against the very group of people imposing and enforcing the laws which are unjust – Every government will be tyrannical in a single generation. As each law is enforced with an underlying threat of violence to be jailed or killed in the moment, each interaction with an agent of the law proclaimed to be authorized to enforce laws must be met with equal willingness to commit violence and self-defense. If for no other reason than to cease the legalized violence in the moment to resume peaceful reasoning and communication, this is the incarnate of violence begets violence. So I think protesting needs to be something where we force the hand of whoever we're protesting against because protesting against government is always about exposing the violence inherent in the system. We want them to act first. We want them to show the violence. We want them to show the unreasonableness of their position. That's what we want to do. So we do not want to – protest and follow their rules, we want to call their bluff. And yes, this means people could be killed. But if we are serious about this, we will call their bluff and put them on the spot, not us. We'll put those National Guard soldiers on the spot who killed all those people at Kent State in the 80s. I think maybe it was in 1980. Was that what it was? Something we'll like put, that. yeah, we'll put them on the spot. We'll put all of those soldiers on the spot, like in Waco, Texas. Regardless of what happened, the federal government should not have been doing whatever it is that they were doing. We should put them on the spot. That's what we need to do. We need to focus the attention on them, and that is incredibly and increasingly more difficult to do with each passing generation. So, what's the issue with how to protest? Call the bluff of the individual willing to initiate violence against you, having no path of clear path of thought progression concerning 
why they're doing what they're doing. That, that I think, is a start. My method when I talk to people first is to have them understand basic morality is and that they understand basic morality as most people I think do. And once you can establish a foundation of principles, then they begin to understand that no other human being has rights that they do not have, right? You can't delegate a right you don't have. And so in doing that, I try to show that the state actually doesn't exist, right? Just uh, as Mark Stevens says, it's just people with guns forcing you to pay them. Once enough people understand that, then this whole idea of, you know, the separation of the people and the, and the government, you know, no, it, it's just, they're just people, right? They're just people who claim the moral right to rule and the legitimate use of violence in society. Once that veneer of legitimacy is stripped, that's it. It's laid bare and uh, they're just a, a, a violent criminal gang, right? Or mafia. And so really to me, there's really no need to protest at all. <laughs> and and the, which is why to me what why protests are so inefficient because they're actually admitting that they do have legitimacy and oftentimes when people protest they're not protesting the existence of government they're protesting a specific government action right a specific law a specific so you mean, uh, protesting with the signs and going in front of the government buildings and stuff like that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. They're, they're protesting a specific government action or the, the president shouldn't be doing this he should be doing that <laughs> and so they automatically assume that the state has legitimacy to do something. And so what I try to get people to realize is that, no, that, that the, the state does not have uh, legitimacy whatsoever. And, uh, and so I think the goal of, of volunteers and peaceful anarchists are, is, is to spread that idea of, of self-ownership and property rights that, that nobody has a right to steal your property, to take your property against your will and uh, any institution claiming the right to do so, even if they call themselves a state, is is criminal and, and would be considered theft. So, so yeah, so, so protest to me is just completely moot, you know, unnecessary, irrelevant, um, counterproductive, and very dangerous too, because most of the time, a lot of the violence that occurs to people is oftentimes at these protests, right? By police officers, by military personnel. And so, and for what, you know, it's, it's not, to me, it's just, it's ineffective. It's unnecessary. And people, people have to use their words. People have to use concepts, language, right? The, the reason that these police officers and these soldiers believe that they are serving something greater it's it's an idea right the idea of statism they they, they believe they are serving something legitimate and if we can um convince these people intellectually that no this this idea is at its foundation corrupt and rotten then i think that will automatically bring bring about a peaceful world completely without any need of, of any any sort of protest so yeah, so so that's that's my goal is basically to say that protesting is yeah inefficient, dangerous, counterproductive. There are much better ways to bring about change than uh, holding up a sign. <laughs> yes, there are definitely more efficient ways of, of doing that. And so I like I like the fact that we both came to the same conclusion about that, where we actually have to we want to know what the morality is that they're using to, to justify intervening into our lives. We want to, hey, look, do you want me to shoot back at you and you risk losing your life? Because that's what's going to happen. You're, you're one soldier. Mm -hmm. You're one, one soldier, buddy. But not a lot of people, it takes a lot of courage to get to that point there. And I'd be the first to admit, I may not have that courage. I'm not interested in, in that. I've had enough interactions in my life where I don't want that I, I i want to think that i'm hopefully smart enough to be able to avoid that and first enough in nonviolent communication and other things to where i can avoid that unfortunately the amount of time and energy that is going to have to be invested into such things is seemingly an impossible amount so 
we we both know, and I'm pretty sure our listeners knew long before us because they're a smart bunch, that understanding the fundamentals, the basics, that's what we have to get to the root of. And you said it just a moment ago that uh, we have to show them that their philosophy is corrupt and, and terrible. And the thing is, is that maybe their philosophy is not corrupt. Maybe it's just incomplete. Think about that. Their philosophy is probably any, any advocate of government, any advocacy of statism is going to be an inco incomplete or a clouded or completely uh, opaque philosophy. It's going to demand that individuals actually go through and just adhere to something, have blind faith to it. And this is something that a lot of advocates of voluntarism, a lot of advocates of various flavors of anarchism specifically, but they will relate the idea that government is just another religion, that statism is just another religion. And the core of that, I, I think, at least for me in understanding this, is that it requires faith in something that nobody really understands how to explain without any sort of contradicting ideas or without having something to just take for faith. So yeah, I think we have to strip away definitely, absolutely, the whole idea that the advocacy of government and the use of violence to impose or encourage certain acts of behavior, that has to be exposed for being inadequate, not there at all, lacking additional contemplation as to what it's supposed to be because – now. I'm curious, the noble intent of government. Now, I see the noble intent of government, what I remember being raised as, and my studies of the American War of Federal Aggression, the, the American Civil War to everybody else, I'm sure, is that the noble intent of government was to protect the masses from hordes of barbarians and invaders to basically more or less what the Constitution says to provide for the general welfare, meaning kind of help people in need and so on. But on a very limited basis. Now, that's the noble intent, and that's how does mobbing somebody to help somebody else, how is that not inconsistent? That's what we have to show, I think. When you grow up, or well, when you're a child, most people believe you know, that Santa Claus brings the gifts, right? That the Easter Bunny brings the money. And then as you grow up, you don't have to fight or protest Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny, you just understand, huh, there's no Santa Claus, <laughs> there's no Easter Bunny, and that's it, it's just gone. <laughs> you understand that it was an illusion and it wasn't real. And and to me, that's also um, the whole idea uh, behind statism and, and the, the state and government is that um, people must understand that no, it's just uh, they're just regular men and women. You know, they just wear special costumes. But no, they're just regular men and women that think that it's okay to uh, kidnap people and rob their currency and uh, invade other countries, and and they have no repercussions like an individual would. So another thing is interesting is that um, what, what is it in the Declaration of Independence? Right, it's like people has it worded. A people have a right to. If their if their government becomes tyrannical to to overthrow it something like that right and uh -huh. yep. cre create a new one or 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 even um, let's say if you don't like something you know I have a right to this blank you know I have a right to blank and you know the government must provide me with blank and and it's just it's just strange that people have this idea that rights originate with the state right and their right to bear arms comes from the Second Amendment. Right, that slavery is wrong because of the what Thirteenth Amendment, <laughs> you know, um, that so people have this idea, or or their freedom of speech comes from the First Amendment, <laughs> you know, they have this strange idea that all these rights come from the state and from parchment written by men claiming the the, the moral right to rule over others. And in reality, no, it does not. You know, it, you do not have to it, you do not have to appeal to an institution that uses coercion to claim these rights for yourself, right? They're human rights. They're rights that we're all born with. There's a saying that the, 
you know, the, the government that is strong enough to give you rights is also strong enough to take away your rights, right? So I, I think it's very important for people to understand that, that no, your rights do not originate with the state at all. And it's very dangerous for you to believe that um, because you're, you're immediately um, forfeiting your individuality, your sovereignty, your self-ownership. And, uh, and, and I think that's what we're trying to help people to understand you know, it is that, um, no, you know, we, you don't have to elect a politician. You don't have to influence a new law or, or, or fight for a new tax because you think that's better than that tax. No, <laughs> no, we can use the basic tools of, uh, of morality and self-ownership and property rights to evaluate the, uh, legitimacy of these actions or these, um, declarations. And for the most part, they are criminal and illegitimate. And so, yeah, it's vital, vital we, that we uh, that we get that concept across to people. Yes, I agree. That is what we need to need to be working on, with an emphasis on on the idea of making sure we can distinguish between what authority is. Now, this is something that is very popular among a lot of advocates of liberty, where they just say, "Oh, authority is bad." But I very rarely see. Anyone actually make the distinction between legitimate authority and illegitimate authority? So if we want to protest something, how do we know what we're protesting and standing up to and, and what violence or what kind of coercion we're actually trying to prevent? How do we know? And how we can figure that out is going to actually be with the understanding of how to break down concepts, meaning that I mentioned previously, and, and you talked about this too – where the government does not does not offer or provide any kind of transparency or a complete idea of where it gets its authority from. There's no there's no transparent path of thought progression, let alone a complete path of thought progression offered with that. So talking about the rights, where well, where do we get our rights from? Well, we get our rights from not government, but we get our rights from understanding what morality is. If we were to build on those rights, as I laid out earlier on, then we understand that we get those rights because morality is a set of communicable barriers that we want to actually set between ourselves to avoid unnecessary acts of destruction. With those comes self-ownership. So long as we maintain and improve the quality of our lives and we do not hinder anyone else and we – make in the moment exchanges and trades through the respect of consent in order to acquire all of the real wealth, all the good services and ideas useful for satisfying the four basics of our life. If we get, if we tr make peaceful trades to get those in by respecting that consent, then we are already engaging in the foundation of rights. All rights stem from self-ownership from this, from this kind of a, Understanding of what morality is. It's very basic. It's very simple, but sometimes simple is easier to understand for the common man. So understanding this, being able to explain not just how rights work, but why they work, why we invoke them is going to make all the difference in the world. It's going to put government to shame, which is why I think this is just speculation on my point on my part at this point here, but all of that legal Mumbo jumbo, walking onto the onto the courtroom floor and having to go through those swingy doors. It's like on a ship or whatever, and doing all that maritime law business and all that gobbledygook, <laughs> which is total crap as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it's 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 just junk. It's convoluted, unnecessary legal speak that almost nobody understands, and a lot of people who do understand it often get it wrong. It's like I swear, it's like. <laughs> Having to pay the IRS taxes where you could call the IRS 15 times, talk to 15 people, and get 27 different answers for the same question, and they're all wrong. <laughs> I mean that's – it's so convoluted and unnecessary, and this is, this is something that if somebody can offer to you a clear path of thought progression, a clear, complete path of thought progression explaining why we invoke these sorts of things – how we invoke these sorts of things, who, what, when, where they apply to, and it's universally applicable to everyone, meaning everybody who's reason capable, then 
bam, there you go. That's what we need. And then we understand, we can break down and understand what we're protesting and what is it that we're always protesting? We're always protesting somebody interjecting violence or coercion that was unnecessary into our lives. It's always the same. Strip that away, get make, make people understand, or I don't know if we should go bender from Futurama and make people understand our peaceful ways or not, but we should definitely uh, do what we can to be patient with people and maybe employ some nonviolent communication, but uh, mostly patience, I think, with ourselves would go a long way because it can be a real long and arduous journey to get somebody else to understand something. But um, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Protesting the violence uh, in the moment is what we need to do. I think that will do a lot of good. And I think a, a, a distinction has to be made when people you know, want to affect change in the state and then when they want to affect change in private businesses and, you know, when a private business with no ties to the state, like I'm not talking about the, uh, you know, the mega corporations that have their lobbies and they have their, um, you know, they write their, their own laws and their own regulations and regulatory capture and all that crap. Now I'm talking about people who do not have any ties, do not have any special interests and, and deals and all that kind of stuff. If they, if a private business does something wrong, there's no need to protest. <laughs> word, I think word will travel so fast <laughs> Absolutely. that it's just completely unnecessary. And so, and especially now with the internet, right? And, and uh, mm -hmm. how quickly communication is online and, uh, you know, Amazon and Yelp and all these different kind of ways to um, evaluate businesses, protest, like well, who would do that? <laughs> Why would you protest? Could you imagine uh, Walmart <laughs> having AK-47s at the front, their Walmart greeters, mm -hmm. they're standing up there, welcome to Walmart, aisle 12, now. You know? <laughs> Nobody would tolerate that. Right. <laughs> and, and, so the, and so the idea that we need to protest or people feel they need to protest the state just shows um, how much the state doesn't care about people. <laughs> like they, they, they don't care what you think. It's like they're, they're, they're really, they're not there to appease you. They're not there to please you. They're not, they're not trying to make your life better. I think really what, what the state is concerned with is um, maintaining, consolidating and increasing power and you know how do we how do we take as much currency as possible without the the <laughs> the the wealthy escaping with their money to the Cayman Islands or or escaping to the country altogether and so it it's it's just amazing how people who protest the state they really do believe that politicians care for them that they really care what they think <laughs> the reality is that they don't and 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 the fact that, you know, people protest, like, I, I can understand people protesting like Monsanto and, you know, DuPont and these, these enormous pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies and all that, you know, and understand that because they have massive corporate immunity uh, shield and, and sovereign immunity from litigation, from, uh, uh, from repercussions, you know, from their actions. I could understand people protesting that, but people would never, ever protest an entirely private business because there's no need to, because there's there's self-regulating mechanisms in they, the marketplace. They, they, they would protest in the same way that they would protest a the government. They'd be like, you know what? Screw you, Walmart. I'm going to, <laughs> right. going to Kroger or I'm going to Albertsons or I'm going someplace else. You know, They, they would vote with their money, but you right. can't do that with government. Right. You, you can't do that. But I, wanna, I wanna address something that you mentioned about um, about governments not caring. I think, I think that's absolutely right, especially the higher up in a government, higher in the government hierarchy and the chain of command you go, that can't be truer than they just don't care. I, I, I'm just going to say it. I, I know that people are going to say, well, Trump is just doing his best because he, he legitimately thinks he's trying to make a positive change. No, Trump, Trump doesn't care. He, he's up there. It's a show for him. Um, you know, I think the, the small politicians on the local levels, I think they really do. Some of them really do care. I think the, the entries uh, in the the new politicians that get in and replace somebody who's been sitting there for a while, I think they care. I mean, you have your politicians who care like Ron Paul, but they don't take it far enough. I mean, I think that's where a lot of the people who are protesting, I think they legitimately think that that there there's hope. Maybe it is a bad signal for good people to get involved in politics. Maybe it's a bad signal for that. It, it might it might be actually doing more harm for us than good in the long run. I mean, 
if we want to be able to stop government, we probably need to expose the violence inherent in the system in a large enough fashion that people make a choice. People make a choice not unlike what happened in 1861. Now, I'm going to get a lot of flack for this because a lot of people do not quite understand their history and understand what was going on. And they're going to tell me, oh, well, they fired on Fort Sumter first. It doesn't matter. Most people don't take into account that there were dozens of other forts in question, that the negotiations had all but stalled and that had been going on in some cases for 10, 12 months at that point, that Lincoln outright refused to let – to negotiate after he got into office at a certain point, refused to negotiate. Hmm. Uh, so those are the things that – that right there, we have to force their hand. The problem is we cannot be the first to initiate violence. We have to force their hand. Now, had the union – after they declared – after Lincoln called for 75,000 troops to be, uh, to be molded into a makeshift army out of Virginia, which is what caused uh, Virginia's secession from the Union, had they fought or attacked first, that would have been a completely different story. It would have been a war of aggression, plain and simple, and that is what we have to – that's what we have to do. So – we want to call – we want to get them to expose themselves first. We want to stop trying to give out hope that it can be changed, and I think go that route. But absolutely, I think the farther up you go, the longer a politician, an elected individual or whoever has been in office, no, they don't care anymore. They do not care anymore. The younger ones like – what, what was the guy's uh, – he was real popular – I think uh, in, when the Tea Party movement was real strong a few years ago, uh, it was, it, it, Justin Amash, is, is that his name? Mm, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I don't follow what, him, though. <laughs> what's that? I, I don't follow him much, though. <laughs> I, I don't know. That's why I don't know anything about him. I, okay. <laughs> I, I, think, I think he was one of the people who was in the Tea Party. I could be – I'm probably wrong because I, I just don't follow. It just doesn't make that – doesn't matter. Right, right, It doesn't right. matter what they do. <laughs> so, I mean – now he's turned into all sorts of this horrible stuff here. I mean, even with the with the recent election of Trump into office, all these anarchists or self proclaimed anarchists going, "Oh yeah, Trump is we're going to avoid nuclear war." Okay, <laughs> about that. How is that working out for you? Because uh, it looks like Trump is strategically moving Korea closer to its nukes instead. I like, you know, I mean, they're not actually moving more troops closer to Korea, and they're not trying to do all sorts of other things, you know. But they are doing a whole lot of other nasty things that it's like. They don't care. They absolutely don't care. Uh, and it's so, so absolutely. That's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's really amazing how um, how people like like anarchists and volunteers can put out, you know, reams of many many memes about uh, the hypocrisy and contradictions that um, politicians say and do constantly and nobody cares nobody cares <laughs> you know it's like um memes of memes huh. right it's like we, we that memes are something that's one thing we don't have a shortage of is memes um and, and you know some of them do get a good reach but you would think like like ah, oh, we got him look here's a contradiction no nobody cares <laughs> You know, like Obama said one thing about Sorry. Obamacare, it's going to go down the premiums, and they went up. Nobody cares. You know, um, what did Trump say? We're going to get troops out. We're going to do less drone strikes. He's doing more drone strikes. Nobody cares. <laughs> hey, maybe he's not doing more. He's doing more expensive drone strikes. <laughs> and and um, yeah, so it seems like most people really do believe uh, that the state has a legitimate function, right? And, and so it doesn't matter how many contradictory uh, memes people make uh, showing the hypocrisy of politicians. You know, there's they're always rationalizing it, and and you know it's uh, 
You know, he's he's in he's a, he's what do they say about Trump? He's playing 4D chess. <laughs> he's uh they're uh he's doing some master plan nobody understands. Don't worry, it's all going to work out. <laughs> right. And um, nobody understands. Nobody. I'm not sure he understands what's going on. <laughs> he's probably also not pulling his own strings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so it's um yeah, and that's 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 the that's the linchpin. That's the crux for me is is getting people to to realize, uh, yeah, the illegitimacy of the state and it's the fact that they most of them, like like you said, the the higher up you get, they just don't care. And and how could they care? I mean, there's 320 million people in the United States. How could they possibly care for such a diverse group of people? It's impossible. You know, you they're gonna. Any kind of legislation or taxation is going to inevitably harm some group of people, and yet, again, it's it, the system continues to grow, continues to swell and expand, and uh, yeah, and the, the invasions continue, the drone strikes continue, and you know, as long as it's uh, you know written as a law, as long as it's written, the regulation is written down, or maybe they're, they're going to make another amendment to justify this. <laughs> this drone strike, then it's going to be okay because it's written down, right? <laughs> that's that's the important part. <laughs> no kidding. I, it's so it's so frustrating to have to watch all of this go down, and everybody's protesting these things here, and nothing is changing. It's just a rinse and repeat cycle of the same thing that happened ten years ago, and then ten years before that, and then ten years before that, and and I think among people who understand how to define the purpose of why we invoke morality, why peace is not necessarily the end goal, but it is the means to achieving the variety of goals that we want to see in our lives, to understand what we want freedom from. For these people here, I think one of the most important things is that we can do is to learn patience, not necessarily for others, but for ourselves. More along the lines of accepting patience or learning patience for ourselves to accept the things that we cannot change until we are presented with the opportunity to do so. And that opportunity comes in two forms, I think. The first is change the one thing that we can change with exclusive control, and that's ourselves. And then to seize the opportunity when somebody makes the honest inquiry of, you know what? I think I want to think I want to get into something else. I just don't understand what we can do about government. And that might not be the exact wording, it's probably not going to be the exact wording, but I think if we can just show ourselves patience to have patience with other individuals in order to serve ourselves kind of a I don't remember which philosopher, which economist or whoever said this, but something about the idea of economics is essentially – or one of the fundamental ideas of economics is to serve ourselves by serving other people, and that's kind of what we want to do with the philosophy of voluntarism and what we want to do with protesting. Hey, look, I, I'm not a voter, and then of course they're going to laugh and they're going to ridicule you and they're going to chastise you, and I'm going to – patience with ourselves, to have patience with them until they get to a point. If they do, or maybe they don't, but to have that kind of a patience to be able to, hey, look, somebody's going to come along where you can actually take everything that you've learned and explain it to them. And that right there, if we force it and cram this stuff down people's throats, it's going to make us no different than the rest of the angry and hostile anarchists out there giving us a bad name. It's going to make us no better and no different than government except we don't have a 12-year – indoctrination system and the guns to impose this on everybody it's just we're, we're just using a, a a lower down scale down much cheaper version of what they're using which is force and hostility and aggression ignoring their consent so we have to be patient with ourselves we can protest little things and we can by walking away voting with our feet and voting with our money but the bigger things, the violence, what gives government its power, what gives the hostility and, and anger of other people power, the violence that they decide to invoke outside of the realm of their own immediate self-defense, that right there, we have to protest in the moment and say, hey, look, 
I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with that, and I am willing. I'm willing to escalate this all the way to one of our deaths if you're not willing to back down. Because all I want to do is do what we absolutely have to do every step of the way, and that's sit down and talk about this. I think that right there, one of the most important things that we can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It got it got me thinking about the, you know, the Ron Paul campaign. And that was frustrating for me too. And how much, yeah, how much support that got. And, you know, he really, he reached a lot of people, you know, the argument can be made that, uh, that he, he, he made more anarchists and volunteers than any other, you know, podcast or book or personality. And he was a politician. However, you know, what's interesting to note is that even though he had such a large following and people were so excited about him, what did he achieve in his life? Did he, how many laws did he actually repeal? How many tax, taxes did he actually repeal? How many regulations? Did the size of the federal government shrink? Did the size of the national debt shrink? <laughs> did, we, did we evacuate from some, of the, from some of the other countries that we're occupying? Did we stop any of the wars? Did we, you know, any, any of that? Did, did any of the drone strikes decrease? <laughs> no. <laughs> None of that decreased. Uh, and they actually increased which is very interesting interesting that it just shows you how powerful the belief in, in in the state the belief in authority how powerful statism has been uh, indoctrinated into so many people uh through government schooling and so it, it again just showing you how ineffective um protesting is even when there's a politician with such a significant backing, right? Um, and, and he did a lot to spread, you know, Austrian economics and volunteerism and free market capitalism and all that. Um, but he was just a, a drop in the ocean. <laughs> even all, of, even with all of that, you know, he was like a man trying to push back a tsunami, you know. And, and so it, 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 that's their turf. The state is. That's the turf of the politicians. No, that's not our turf. You know, I think our turf, the way of peaceful anarchists and voluntarists is the internet, is communication, is spreading ideas, w using these tools that have been given to us by enterprising individuals, right? That have, that have uh, created this beautiful system, this beautiful network that we all use and that is so much more powerful than uh going out on the streets with a with a picket sign and with um you know holding hands and blocking roads no <laughs> it's so much more effective uh than that and it's so much less dangerous <laughs> than that oh, that is that's what we're trying to avoid is the nasty violence and, and danger and the destructive things that's what we want to avoid i i couldn't agree more the communication thing i used to think when I was a kid, all those inspirational posters plastered all over my government school, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, one thing. And, and then when I got out of school and I started going into into the workforce, I noticed all these things here. These, 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 I hated these posters growing up and right out of high school. It's like like they would have communication is key. They'd be like communication is and there would be a picture of a key right there to <laughs> your success or to your safety. You know, I used to hate all those things. I used to make fun of them all the time. <laughs> but, but you're absolutely right. I mean – it is absolutely true that communication is key and that right there right now it's going to be through the internet to be able to convey as many ideas as we possibly can but when the internet goes away we still have to be able to convey these ideas we still have to be able to understand them and if we cannot do what what you suggested is to strip away all the things and expose the state for what it is, the initiation of violence and the violation of consent. If we can't strip that away, absolutely, it, it, it's, it's going to be a problem. So, yeah, communication is key without a doubt. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's I think that's where where people have to uh, have to focus their efforts because, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's true. One day, you know, the internet might might go away, but I I highly doubt it. You know, that's one thing people say about that they um they they don't like Bitcoin, right? They're like, well, what if there's a grid failure and everything shuts down, and and what's going to happen to your Bitcoin then? 
Well, I'll still have more than you. <laughs> I mean, I think that's entirely unlikely because, uh, number one, I think people assign too much power, too much credibility to the state. Uh, and, and although the state does have a monopoly on violence and all that, the state is at the same time very incompetent. You are being very kind to the state. <laughs> incompetent and awkward and backward and dinosaur. You know, it's it's like a it's a, it's a horse and buggy in the in the age of spaceships you know that's what the state is right so so to, so people oftentimes have this have this feeling like oh the, the state is this all-seeing eye you know they can see everything they know what you're doing in your bathroom in your living room they know everything about you and and they can shut off the internet like a, like a switch on and off they can just shut it off whenever they want <laughs> and i think that's really um being too kind and too credible uh giving the state too much credit right yes uh, it's when, a big bluff yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 really yeah. Definitely, it, it definitely is a big bluff, and it's like, it's it, what they what the state has is guns and intimidation and fear, right? That's what they have. That's their power. And so, like you said, once once we call it's bluff, and you know, by doing that is you know you know one thing I, I I help people to realize is that you know how many people in the United States are armed, right? Like something like hundred million people are armed, right? And how many how many police officers are in the United States, like, I don't know, maybe a million, right? And I don't know how many soldiers, I don't know, maybe something like a million, right? Mm -hmm. Far, far out number, far out number, you know, and, and how many IRS agents are there? I don't know. I don't know, a couple thousand, right? Mm -hmm. Very little, right? And yet 300 million people are scared into giving up 30% of their ta of their income. Right, thirty, forty percent of their income every year, um, out of fear, out of intimidation. But when you understand these statistics and these numbers, you realize that no, most, most of uh, of the power of the state is rooted in fear, fear and intimidation. Right. Another way to look at the state as a parasite. Right. So the, the state really cannot get that large because if the parasite does get too large, it will kill the host. <laughs> and then the parasite will die. So, you know, it's the it's the voluntary transactions, it's the free market that actually produces the wealth and the nourishment that actually keeps the the, the state alive, keeps these uh these blood sucking parasites alive. <laughs> and so that's another reason why they can't grow uh oh, that so big. now you're just flirting with the agents of the state by calling them parasites and blood sucking. <laughs> you better be careful. Why she does she listen to this? flirting with all these people <laughs> right <laughs> so um so yeah so it's um yeah too, too much credibility is assigned uh when in fact you know uh, i think i think you made a great meme uh, that, that the state is fear you know where, where there's like a, you know in the shadow it looks like a, um, a hand yeah yeah no 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 it looks like a, a dinosaur and then it's just like a, it's like lego a oh, lego yeah, piece yeah. <laughs> i love that one that's a great it's a great meme Oh, so the, the other thing with the businesses here, this is something that a lot of other people don't consider. But So do you like watching movies? Um, yeah, definitely. Have you, Do you like the uh, Marvel movies, you know, the Iron Man and the Spider-Man and all of them? Sure. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen a good you like, do you like the Do you like the uh, Pixar movies like Cars and Monsters and Monsters, Inc. and all them? Yeah, I've seen a few of those as well. Yeah, guess what? G guess what company makes those? Guess what company makes Star Wars now? Disney. Mm -hmm. Now – how many billions of dollars is Disney worth? How many billions of people does Disney employ? How much? How many billions of dollars does Disney have invested in all sorts of things? How powerful do you think Disney is? Now think about that. What if Disney called the bluff of Uncle Sam? What mm. if Disney covertly put guns in the hands of all of the people it employs. <laughs> you think they might be a match for Uncle Sam to call their bluff? Or what about Microsoft? How powerful Microsoft is. Despite whether or not you like Bill Gates' politics or not, right. what if he suddenly flipped the switch and was all, you know what? Government is no good. And then decided to put software in his machines that allowed us to completely lock it down from outside attacks. I, mean, I don't know if that's possible or not. I'm not I'm no software engineer, but theoretically speaking, how much power would he have? Still far more power than the government would have. I mean, the government isn't, no, 
the government is stupid enough to where they would think that they can shut things down and then just make a bunch of people mad and then they would sign their own death warrant, I guess, by that. <laughs> I think it's just – I mean think about that, calling the bluff of government. We don't need a picket sign. I mean if I was going to have a picket sign, I would probably do something reminiscent of SpongeBob and go out there and draw a big old nose with a finger in it and <laughs> march around with that. You know, just pick, you know, free picks for everybody. You know, I, I don't know. It's just mm. – <laughs> we have so much more power than the government does. It's just, it's just a bluff that has to be called. Have you, it's a matter of time. Have you heard of that guy uh, Vermin Supreme? Uh, yeah, the, the free ponies for everybody yeah, guy. Yeah, I love that guy. <laughs> Just, just highlighting the the complete lunacy and absurdity of the entire system, of the entire, you know, electoral process and politicians, and <laughs> and I, I love it. And he's, uh, I mean, he's a great spokesman for uh, for that kind of absurdity, and he really, he, he really shows how uh, impossible a lot of what they say is, you know, um, by just pushing it to the extreme. Um, and, and yeah, so, so I think he does a, he does a good amount to undermine the legitimacy of the state in his own way. <laughs> yeah, no kidding there. Do you think what he does goes over the heads of a lot of people, especially hardcore voters? You, th- you think they just completely missed the point? Think maybe, just- probably. Um, but, but maybe not at the same time when he says, you know, free ponies for all. And then, then they start saying, wait a minute, how's that going to be paid for? <laughs> Where are these ponies going to come from? <laughs> maybe. I hope I hope more people are asking those questions than not. I mean. Oh, right. Or or he says, he says I'm going to make a law forcing everyone to brush their teeth. <laughs> and, then, and then I hope they ask the question, well, what happens if I don't brush my teeth? <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so so that's that's another – I guess he's he's protesting in his own way, right? <laughs> By doing that, um, but, uh, but protesting, no. <laughs> Please don't do it. Please stay home. Devote your energies to improving your life, making the world a better place, promoting peace, freededom, and love. By creating value in the world, that's how you. Absolutely. That's how you improve the world. Not by protesting. Not by paying you know attention what? to. What psych- if? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. hey, I was just like, what if, what if, what if the ultimate slap in the face to government doesn't come from us, but comes from our children, whom we teach how to break down concepts and understand the importance of a clear path of thought progression, a complete clear path of thought progression, so that when they get older, they're like, government, uh, what are you, a caveman? <laughs> so. Maybe that would be the best way to protest is simply right. to, hey, teach our children this. Don't teach them to do the completely cover your head in a tinfoil hat and live in a bunker underground type of anarchy. But <laughs> teach them teach them how to think for themselves. Let our children do it because government is some, isn't something that took place or, or came into existence at the snap of a finger overnight. It took generations in some of the books that I've read it's by some authors, uh, specifically those detailing ancient civilizations, you know, uh, a, lo- a lot of them having to do with what Turkey eventually evolved into and the Ottoman Empire and so on, where they say that government is something that uh, was a kind of a strange concept in some parts of the world. Uh, it, it's, it's early at, or as late as about uh, 10,000 BC. So. Maybe it's maybe I mean it's definitely something that took place over generations and generations. So we can't expect to be able to protest in, in, now and government suddenly go away. It's going to be something that's going to be a generational thing. So yeah, that'll have to be the ultimate slap in the face or the ultimate invitation to come join us to say, hey, look, there's more of us who understand something more efficient. So let's let's drop the guns. Stop demanding a tribute. And let us show you how to provide everything you need for yourself without ever having to depend on anybody else ever again. Maybe that's the best way to protest. But then it's going to be very difficult for people to get there because you and I spent how many years understanding all of this? How many years did we have to break? So it's it's definitely going to be a generational thing for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. We're uh, we're coming up on the hour, but uh, but I just want to say that <clears> – <throat> Yeah, I love that the idea of uh, instead of protesting, just focus on what you want to see in the world. Right? You want to see, you know, more 
you know, more compassion, more kindness, more peace, freedom, and love. And, and that's what we emulate and teach to our kids because, you know, in the words of, of Frederick Douglass, easier to raise compassionate children than to repair broken men. And I, I really love that quote. And, uh, and it's so powerful to make the case for peaceful parenting and reasoning with your kids and, uh, you know, talk to, talking to them and explaining to them like they're independent human beings because they are. And then of course, you know, keeping your kids as far away from the government school system as, as you can. Uh, I think that's, that's going to be one of the best ways that we can bring about a brighter future without the dangers that inevitably come from, uh, protesting and, and trying to, um, you know, devote your energy, your very scarce and precious energy towards, uh, you know, changing the actions of, of megalomaniacs and sociopaths who really in the end do not care about you. So uh, yeah. focus your energies, your limited energies on where it will matter most, where it will impact the most. And I think, uh, I, I definitely agree that, uh, the next generation is very, uh, is fundamental, is instrumental in producing the world that we're all striving for. I will take it. I will take it. Yeah, that was a fast hour. I wasn't expecting it to go that that quick. Didn't get through all my notes either, but that's okay. It's okay. Hey, we have time to plug the Patreon that will be. Oh, ready. oh, oh! oh I, I, I didn't, I didn't finish it. <laughs> I didn't wrap up yet. Um, uh, actually, um, why don't you finish up uh, with your um your final words? <laughs> final words. Uh, you know what? Just. I think I've said everything I can say now, so it's okay. Final words, just, you know, hey, one mind, one word, one generation at a time. That's that's the slogan I have for my Liberty Defined page, so. Right. Yes, definitely. So we're working on our um, Patreon page. So if hopefully when this, when this episode goes up, the Patreon uh, page will be live. So if you want to support us, you can uh, visit that website and donate there. Um, and also, I think we're going to have merchandise available soon as well. Yep. Yep. So, I'm working on that as well. So if you want to, uh, you can support us that way, spreading the message of, of uh, volunteerism through um, buying our merchandise <clears throat> and being a walking advertisement. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we are no, uh, we are no stranger to, uh, uh, to marketing. So <laughs> yeah, capitalism is not an evil word in this podcast. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, please support us. If you enjoy our work, provide value for value, a dollar show is all we ask. Um, if you find support, if you find value in our work, please support us. Uh, so we can produce more of it. Um, that is the capitalist way. So thank you very much everyone, uh, for listening. This is Daniil Cuellar and Jim Liver Davis from the Philosophy of Volunteerism. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.